Hi, this is Eli Oakletree of the Snow King Beekeepers Association, and this is the third Wednesday monthly meeting on January 19th. We're going to have quick announcements and maybe some quick questions and answers starting now at 6.30, and then by 7, I want Michael to start speaking. We are available. Quite a number of us love to talk bees, and after the presentation and after the questions people have about our quilting beekeeper's way of running his apiary and raising bee, raising queen bees. After that, we'll stay and talk all night. But the recording will be basically for the announcements and the presentations, and then we'll turn it off so we can have free questions and answers. So, I will go return to the first part of the... Here we are. Official start. And just the announcements... Dues are due, $20. Uh, there's a limited number of benefits to membership. The high sites, which are going to start in March, that is part of them. Saturdays and Sundays, we'll have more information on that in the next, in the February newsletter. We're still putting that together. The beginner classes, the apprentice class, the journeyman's class are basically already started in full. So unless you have a special reason you need to join now, Call me if you do. Eli. We're going to record this meeting. We put it out public on YouTube. The classes are different. I have to send you the link when you take a class. I send you a link. So quickly, we'll do 30 minutes. Get off here. Get off the that 30-minute questions, answers, discussion. Then we will go to the presentation by 7 and I want to make sure that Michael gets at least, if he wants, 45 minutes to an hour to present. And everybody would probably has questions for him afterwards. Anytime a beekeeper comes to share their experience, I think this is the best talk we can have. If somebody is willing to say, this is what I do, this is why I do it, and you might try it too. Oh, and share screen does work on Zoom. But you have to tell me when you want to. I will watch the chat while the chat room while hmm, I put that right there. I will watch the chat room while Michael's talking. So uh, hopefully you're already familiar with the club. If you're not, we have a we have two Facebook pages and people get a little confused. One is open to the public. That's the business page. The other one is open to just the people in Western Washington because we find it too confusing to talk to beekeepers who live in Spain and Nigeria, although they're really, they are really interesting people. But still, we need to talk Western Washington bees sometimes. So watch out for two pages. You go to the one in the upper right to ask to join the one that's over to the left. The website's going pretty well. The Snow King Beekeepers are snowkingbka.org. Oh, and you have to check out the joke of the day. I'm so thrilled that I figured out how to post one joke a day, a scheduled post. So you can look forward to that every day. And YouTube. this the, Our YouTube channel is where the recording of this will go. Uh, on the home page, because I still don't know how to really do web design, and I'm getting some help from a few members who know more than me. If you go to the home page, I just put a button there for the Nukes and Packages supplier list for 2022. It's very partial. It's kind of, it does emphasize King and Snohomish County, but we're trying to pick up people from other parts of Western Washington too. When the Snow King beekeepers went online, it ended up being more than, more than just snow in King, Snohomish and King County. That's what we thought. That's why we named it Snohomish, Snow King for Snohomish King County. And we've added a page on facts, and the newsletter is there. So there are buttons on the home page, and then the other pages, most of them work pretty well. If you are working, especially on your journeyman service points, I want to make sure you understand that we do have some booth equipment. You may have seen it at the Evergreen State Fair. We do have a projection screen for indoor, and uh, you, you still have to come. And we have one projector that works with the projection screen. Should you not have Wi-Fi and a setup that you can easily 
project and you want to do a PowerPoint or some kind of projection. Posters. We have some posters stored. That's me at the Mulbacks. And I mention this now because as we wind up for spring, people will suddenly get asked, well, would you be willing to kind of take a booth at the pollinator event at Mulbacks in Woodenville? And that's what I'm doing over at on the right picture, right hand picture. And I just put up some posters and took the smallest possible little hive setup I could and talked to whoever came by. We do have one small extractor for sharing by club members. So there's not a lot of benefits to, to becoming a member. I had mentioned that really quickly. Most of what we do is open to the public, but the hive sites, when you take a class, you pay the dues. Um, and we'll give you all the support we can. I want to go forward. I'm sorry for this. The hands-on. We're going to start in March. And yes, we can't really go into the into beehives reliably in March. It might happen. But if we do it at like 1 o'clock, that could happen. But the things we can do, the more we thought about it, the more we said, well, we can do, we can demonstrate oxalic acid vaporization. I just bought the MK350, which is up in the right-hand corner. And that's um, equivalent of ProVape. Maybe somebody else has a ProVape. I know Ron has one out at the Granite Falls. He has a, a do-it-yourself version, which he'd be happy to tell you all about. The Granite Falls high side is where you get Ron, who's a super do-it-yourselfer. Uh, we can also take a peek under the outer cover, for example. The weather's almost always good enough to do that at this time of the year. And we can look at moisturizing shims and styrofoam and talk about what worked and didn't work. And do you see moisture on the inner cover? Uh, Fleur. I've got a little, the cheapest version you can get of a Fleur camera. You're welcome to come see what you think of it. The Broodminder app is on my phone. We have one temperature sensor at each of the three locations. And we can show you quickly what it does and what it doesn't do. It's sort of more an interesting thing in a lot of ways than something you have to have. So, oh yeah, that was some notes I put. And we love to talk bees. So, I know that I'm going to end up having a one o'clock hands-on at my place because I was asked to by a, by a beginner who said, I just can't visualize this without actually seeing it. And I said, come on out. We got eight frame, um, I've got 10 frame equipment and a couple of a Langstroth long and a Valkyrie Langstroth long. and Take a look at what we've got and think about the equipment that you need to order. And pick up some magazines. We still have brochures, catalogs, bee catalogs from the Evergreen State Fair. Okay, this is exciting. I just did this. Do you see on there that it goes through January 19th today? We actually saw the brood jump. If you look at the top half, the top graph, that's the temperature and it's just kind of neat to see what they told us in the books. It says the queens start to lay again in January. And there it is. There's the jump from down here where they're kind of just keeping the queen warm in the center of the cluster. But they have to do it about, they have to keep her at about 68, 70. And here's the jump. Now it's not totally consistent. I may not have the best placement on my sensor that I have slipped in between the, the high bodies where I felt that they would probably be brooding up where the brood would probably be in the spring and by golly it looks a little raggedy here but I think it's really neat just to see the temperature did the jump I noticed that hive was getting more active and the other thing that's interesting is the outside temperature is down here I think this is the ambient down below so you can kind of see it's not being affected by the ambient the Hive temperature on a healthy hive, of course, is not going to be affected by that. But it's really neat. And we we have one of these sensors at all three hives, and we're figuring out how to put this information on the website because it would be neat to see Granite Falls, Sultan, and Maltby and how they're behaving. The other thing that I thought was really neat is people talk a lot about humidity and the humidity in the hive. And one thing that I noticed was that the humidity the bees didn't appear to be controlling it. I don't think they cared. Maybe they couldn't control it. And at the same time, if you look up above, the same rise in January 12th in the temperature is accompanied by a drop in the humidity. And I don't think that's just weather. 
That's they are now controlling and ventilating that part of the hive. I thought that was kind of interesting. We'll try to get more data to you as we go on. Oh, and here's a bunch of the brochures, magazines, catalogs. If you need them for a booth, if you're stocking a booth someplace, like I said, you're doing a presentation as a journeyman candidate and you're a member of the club, come on. Uh, we, can get you, we can set you up with boxes. We did give out thousands of pieces of literature at the Evergreen State Fair, but we still have more. And we will be reordering a lot of this because you can ask for more every year and get new up to date. Really handy to get the catalogs, the Dedant and the Manlake catalog, and you can leaf through them and find the name of the piece of equipment that you wanted to know about or you wanted to get. Files. I refer to things all the time like the 2022 Nuke Package Supplier as that list as being somewhere. And I say it's on files on the group discussion page on Facebook. Um, I don't think there's anything else. For example, the questions to ask, that's also under files on the group discussion page. We're trying to move a lot of that over to the snokingbka.org page, but it's taking time. I'm going to see if there's anything else that I really wanted to take up your valuable time, and I appreciate your being here. I don't think so. The only thing is I would go back to this. Okay, I would go back to this uh, list and ask, does anybody have something they'd really like to discuss? It is now, we still have 15 minutes before I wanted to ask Michael to start. He can always start early, but I thought I'd give us 15 minutes. Are there questions on this that people would like to ask? This is the shortened version of what I put on the newsletter, available on the website and through the discussion group page. It's done as a link. That's the way Wix, and we're using Wix for our website. That's the way they do it. But at this time of the year, you experienced beekeepers are probably doing all of this. And I thought you might have pictures you want to share. You might want to talk about it. That jump in temperature in January that the broodminder just showed, and I'll bet as soon as Ron and Jessica go check theirs, oh, except that Ron's, I don't think the sensors are in the correct place right now. But Jessica, as soon as she gets a chance to, to check hers, I bet it shows up there too. And I have always wondered when the bees brewed up. And now I finally got an answer after eight years of beekeeping. But that's right after this is when you will see increasing moisture in that inner cover. And this is where the moisture shims sometimes start to really help. They were dry, dry, dry. And now you may see moisture in them because now they're brooding up. They have to control the humidity and they have to move it around. Honey stores. Everybody's checking the honey stores. If anybody really weighs their hives, go ahead and tell us about it with the luggage scale method. I just heft. Like they say, I just lift. Uh, and you can't really be going in right now, not with the way the weather is in most places. That dry sugar on the inner cover is the easiest way to add. I did just, I know that I personally just put pictures on the discussion group of how to make a candy board frame. For a Langstroth long, where do you put the dry feed? So for top bars and Langstroth longs, you take a frame and you put wire mesh on it and you push in your fondant, a little bit of water and a lot of sugar, and you push it in. And I put pictures on the discussion page. And we're all checking our entrances. I had quite a bit of die off this year, but I had some well-established hives. The one that I have the sensor in, I call Mother. And that's the one that I have been borrowing capped brood from all last year. That queen, she's just been wonderful. She's been a great performer. And instead of splitting, I was using her quite often as a resource hive. Uh, the fair queen is doing great. If you went to the fair and you saw the queen in the observation hive, she handled that stress and made it through fine. Her hive is doing great. And we're all looking at our dead bees and we're autopsying them, you know, and worrying about whether they have anything wrong with their wings or do they look dark and greasy? We're doing all that, right? 
and so far so good. Might counts. I got worried. I did Apivar, and for the first time ever, because I don't like those organic, synthetic, large molecule treatments for mites, but I did it. And I don't think it knocked the mites down as far as I'd like. I'm seeing way too much drop right now. So I'm looking at that brooding up, and I'm making the decision i got to get back on the OAV now. And the MK350 is so fast. It's about 150 less than the ProVape. Try not to go. Okay, newer beekeepers don't go into shock, but a ProVape runs like $500. So 250 for uh, something that does basically the same thing. Or if you can do it yourself, get in touch with Ron. I saw him on here. I saw him sign on here uh, through the chat or something. He does the Granite Falls hive sides, and he he made his own Pro Vape equivalent. So if you are looking at maybe you feel like you can do that, I'm not good enough. I'm not going to try that. Do it yourself. But getting the reduced cost vaporizer and I will be happy to demonstrate that uh, later if for when you come for a hive side everybody's thinking about ordering bees and equipment which is why it's important that we got a partial list for Western Washington it, we're doing our best if you want to send names and people in maybe even bee equipment supplies maybe we need to get those on there too And assembling and painting before the bees move in. You do not want to gas your bees out with, with paint fumes late in the year. And I hope I can get to the scraping and repairing. I hope you're all doing it. I'm always stalling. Something else happens. And I love cell phone cameras. When you autopsy a dead out, it does happen. Take pictures. Take lots of pictures. I know sometimes it's heartbreaking and devastating and you really didn't believe the wind would blow over your your hives or whatever, and you end up with a dead out. And then I'm in favor of storing dead outs. Some people seal them up. So people who'd like to comment on how that works for them, with all the wet sloppiness, I just really hate to let things mold any more than they have to. If you have inside storage, even in a shed or a dryer basement, I, I like taking it in. But I understand some people don't have the storage. And everybody's reviewing, catching up on their journals, especially if you're doing two years of journaling for your journeyman. You're not falling behind on that. Planning next year, we start the beekeeper's prayer for cleansing flight weather, which actually my bees have had this year. Last year at this time, they had already been stuck inside for like three months. I saw fecal spotting for the first time ever in eight years last year. Just on the outside of the hive, I feel lucky. And yellow jacket traps. If you had trouble last year, hopefully you're getting those yellow jacket traps out now. And I really should stop talking and give people a quick chance to and check the chat. Let me go back to a, maybe an interesting slide. Or I could... Can I pause this? I'll just end it. Um... Okay. okay, then people can kind of see each other, which is really good. And you see names on here and you say, oh, I was going to get in touch with that person. Hey, Eli, can you hear me? Yes, Les, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I'd like to add something to your list that I discovered today. Oh? Uh, I, happen, I happen to be out at... Uh, at my hives, and I, I, I have one real small hive. Uh, I, I didn't expect it to survive, but it, but it still is. But I noticed a lot of activity at that hive, and, and you know, it was a fairly nice day up here in Bellingham. Uh, but I noticed a lot of activity, and, and I thought, oh, wow, the, girl, the girls are waking up, or, or, you know, it must be an exceptionally nice day. And then I then I realized that I think it was Robbie, it, uh, uh, you know, because it is a weak hive and I have strong hives all around it. So, uh, 
you know, I was I was surprised. I don't, you know, it's the first time I've seen it this time of year. Um, but I, you know, I don't even know if that was what was happening. But I, but I put on a, a robbing screen, uh, and you know, there. Yeah, I just don't think there was that many bees in that hive to have that kind of activity. So, so I'm I'm pretty sure it was robbing. So, so maybe that's something that that you know if. if if the other people have a, a a weak hive amongst some strong ones, then then that's a possibility, I think. Yes, yes, and actually, people who have hive scales, one of the things they discovered was that robbing is a year-round phenomenon, and the hive that wakes up over it over winter, it's strong, it's more robust, and it gets its scouts out earlier, and the scouts can't fly very far when it's this cold. So if you or your neighbor have a stronger hive, yes, robbing happens. And they discovered it with hive scales because like somebody said, how can one hive be suddenly going way up in weight? Pollen just doesn't weigh that much. How can it be going up in weight when it should be using up its nectar stores to raise brood? Okay, it's bringing in pollen, but it should be using that up. And they realized that it was the strong hive was robbing out the week. So actually, I'm really becoming a fan of robbing screens. But the problem with robbing screens is how do you get them on and off for OAV if you're doing putting the wand in through the front and uh, clearing out the bees? And I guess some people use a hook and eye method. I'm going to try one. I'm going to put a picture of it on the discussion group page. I really think the robbing screens is a really great idea. Also, for a lot of reasons, but that's one of them. But there's this idea that you can take, like bungee cords would hook into the to the wire mesh of screen of robbing screens, and then you run a cord around the back to another little. I bought these mini bungee cords, and I'm going to try that because if you screw it on, you have to screw it off every time. If you're doing a set of OAV treatments, this will drive you nuts. At least. For me, who is technically challenged and has to find the cordless drill with the correct bit and the battery has to be charged. Okay, you're, you're exceeding me, my capabilities already. I love bees. I don't like tools. So I'm going to try the bungee cord thing and put a picture and let you know if it happens on the Facebook discussion page. But yes, robbing is... And the other reason robbing screens are important this early, the vespids, the wasps and the hornets, wake up and move at 10 degrees lower than honeybees. And this is true, this is important in the spring, and it's important again in the in the fall. So yeah. So you also want the robbing screens on so the mated queens don't figure out where your hive is and decide to start their nest right next to it. I don't know, that's my anthropomorphic type logic, is if they get a food source, why would they go any farther to set up their nest than easy flight distance of your hive? Velcro. Wade, Wade says, how about Velcro on the, on the... It's a possibility, too. It's worth trying. I think you'd have to staple it on. Or you could do the kind that goes through... Yeah, that, that loops around and, and it... It's made to loop to itself. Okay. I have, I actually have these these little plastic ones that I I think they're made by they're called B Smart. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I carry those in my shop and and so so that it was easy to grab one and stick it on there. So. And and they're just they're just held on with with push pins. Okay. Uh, and so you can just pull the pins if you wanted to remove it to, to treat them or something. Yeah, they're white plastic. And is, are they sold by Better Bee? Be smart, Better Bee. Is there a company that sells them? Glory Bee? Yeah, I'm not. I, I, it's off the top of my mind, of my head. I, I don't know uh, uh, who, who makes them, but it's, 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 yeah, it's. Be smart, better be, or, or, or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a good addition to the list, though. The whole idea of, of watching for the robbing. 
Yeah, I get nervous if there's too much activity. I keep saying, it's a cleansing flight. Please let it be a cleansing flight. But I have my doubts sometimes. Any other comments like that? Or we should let Michael get started. I'll start putting his presentation up, okay? And did you did you say this is recorded? Yes. So I yeah. better stop talking because I'm getting recorded. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, this is recorded. Let me go to... Um, I need to see all of it. No. Okay, I will figure this out in a second. Here we go. And start the slideshow. Okay, Michael, are you about ready with your... Okay. So this is Michael Duncan of Quilcene of Old Bear Honey and Bees. Um, and he's a journeyman candidate. He's already been keeping bees. He's in his fourth year. But it's a good time to do the journeyman. While he's busy mentoring a lot of people and being helpful and answering a lot of questions, why not kind of get credit for that? And I'm looking for you. There you are. Okay. So, ready to go, Michael? Because I'm looking forward to this. Thank you for the introduction there, Eli. And, uh, okay, keep keep forward. Um, oh, shoot. Okay. I lost you on audio. You're muted, Eli. Oh, okay, Michael, you go ahead and I will mute myself. Okay, there you go. Yeah, I, um, we lost you there. So, anyways, thanks for the introduction. Uh, my talk is going to be queen rearing for beginners versus beginning queen rearing. There is a slight difference there. I'm not going to get into um, uh, the science of uh, queen breeding. You don't have to be an automotive engineer to drive a car, just an over eager teenager and trying to get the keys. So, Queen rearing is sort of the same way. Um, I just want to get some basics into the beginner's hands and, and try and get them started. So the next slide, please. Hey, there we go. So I'm the short fat guy on there holding up a third year beekeeper, apprentice working on my journeyman. And for the rest of you that are uh, apprentice and or journeyman, your your turn's coming. So this is one way those service points and um, going towards your certification uh, located in Quill Scene. Next slide, please. There we go. An overview of the points that I'm going to cover, uh, why raise queens and overwinter nukes. 
why I started raising queens and, um, and try and get others uh, encouraged to do so also. We're gonna to touch on equipment and the minimum equipment needs. Then there'll be an overview of additional equipment. I'm not seeing Michael. Okay, we may have, we, he's in Quilsey. We may have lost you for a sec. He came back. Okay, good. He might be frozen. Okay. Give him just a second. Ask him to unmute. There we go. I can see you again, Michael. Next slide, please. Um, Michael, did you finish the how-to and review and questions and answers? Because we didn't hear you. You froze right after you said the word equipment, I think. Michael, we've lost your audio, I think. Um, it, should be, it should be back on. I've got... You're back. Okay. So you do want the next slide? Got it on. Yes, please. So here I am uh, with my son. We're just installing our um, packages. Uh, 2019 was my first year in beekeeping. Next slide. We are uh, happy to um, imitating beekeepers. So uh, let those bees in the box. Uh, next slide. We'll move it this one for a little while. If you look on the lower right there, you'll see uh, my bees are absconding. This is about a week after we installed my packages. I had a beginner's class, so I kind of, you know, you have the information, but it was a major panic for me. Uh, luckily, my mentor was close and came over. We got the lids off. Uh, couldn't find any eggs in that blue hive. He went and grabbed a, a frame out of the white hive, didn't even look at the screen, just shook the bees off of it, dropped it in there. The bees started going back in almost immediately. By the time we got the two hives put back together, all those bees had moved back into their hive. And he'd recommended that I go and uh, buy a new queen, told me that um, trying to raise my own in this area wasn't feasible, that we couldn't raise um, decent queens here. So over that first season, between my son and I, we had um, two packages apiece, four hives. We lost six queens in the first month. And we lost two additional queens throughout the summer. Some of them were uh, laying, some were superseded, some just simply went missing in action, disappeared. Our suppliers, they, re they replaced some, and they made us buy some, basically accusing us of being bad beekeepers and enrolling and, and, and killing queens. So that about that time, the social media started lighting up, the bee club, chat rooms, uh, a lot of other people were in the same boat. So we kind of realized that's killing queens, that um, everybody else was experiencing the same thing. And this led me to 
kind of research the package nuke to Murphy B industry a little bit and try and see if I couldn't find out what was happening and going on. And uh, basically what I found out, uh, the, most of the packages are coming out of California from the almond production. When they're done, they have to get those hives split down so they don't form and get those trucks to the next pollinating contract. The almond producers, they've got to spray pesticides before those flowers completely fall off the trees. And, and they're, so they're pushing them to get them out of the fields. And the commercial queen rearing industry that supplied them, uh, California was having a bad weather year though. Um, the queens need 70 degree weather, no rain to get mated. And it was one weather front after the other that was going through Northern California and Southern Oregon, which was setting back the queen industry quite extensively. I know when we were waiting for our packages to arrive, we kept getting put off a week and then there'd be another week. We actually ended up getting delayed like four weeks in getting our packages. But what happened is these, um, the migratory bee creatures, one and a half million hives of bees that had to move, they just finally said they had to All right, I'm gonna take back. my 15 minutes of vacation time. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, go ahead, Michael. So the, the package bee industry had to start unloading these um, packages and, and get them moved so that they could uh, move on. So there were some unethical practices among the industry and uh, there was a real bottleneck in the clean rearing. So as a consequence, the home hobbyists particularly uh, ended up catching a lot of the, just having a lot of bad queens. And that's what got me started on my journey in the queen room. So I uh, did a little bit of study, learned how to graft. And that's a, a method of taking eggs out of the brood frames, putting them into, not eggs, but um, hatched larvae and putting them into cups and giving them to a cell builder, which is just a strong box of bees and letting them build queens. And I was able to raise 14 queens my uh, first year. I got seven of them mated. We used the few and I went into the winter with four nukes with queens, came out the spring with one. So I lost three of them. Uh, one to children, two to starving. So it's a tough to say. Um, some would call it a failure and possibly give up on queen rearing, but I'd actually managed to pull through one queen and nuke. And that happened to be how many hives I had with that winter with one hive. So I had my replacement high for the one I lost. So I was stoked. Um, for me, it was a major success. And that got me started on my road to queen rearing. I actually, I got a queen through the winter. Yes. Next slide, please. As a note to, the, to that, uh, year two, I ended up raising 70 queens. Last year I did 40. So, uh, uh, picked up the game quite a bit. So I'm going to share some stats and quotes, uh, just a couple. They're coming out of uh, Honeybee Colony Hall, edited by Samatero and Yoder. Um, the chapters are all bee scientists and researchers, and it's an overview of their work. It, it doesn't go into real deep detail on what they're doing in, in bee research, but it does give a good overview of a lot of the uh, science that's being done right now and trying to improve the health of our bees. I'm going to be sharing some of Kobe, uh, WSU bee breeder, lives here in this area, uh, chapter four, and a uh, Dennis Van Engelsdorp, which did some studies in uh, he, he, chapter, chapter 20. So next slide, please. <laughs> Uh, 2008 was uh, the colony collapse disorder. The commercial industry had tremendous losses, 50 to 100 percent losses for a lot of commercial people. Uh, and uh, the scientists, everybody kind of jumped on it, trying to figure out what was going on. And what they found out, uh, this Dennis Inglesdorf. Uh, that about 31% was the queen losses, 28, 26, colony collapse disorder, which is sort of a synergenic um, effect of uh, pesticide 
Agriculture intern, you lost me, back me up. And a lot of um, things that any home by themselves might not be lethal, but when you put them all together, it created a perfect storm for bee losses. And a, and a lot of those things actually, I think, contributed to the queen losses and starvation as well. If you've got weak bees in the camp forage, they can't bring in stores and they're going to starve. Starving bees are going to be feeding the queens and the, and the brood very well. So the, it was kind of a, a negative feedback loop that caused a perfect storm for colony loss. It also happened to be the year that the real estate market crashed and the banks and everything else. So beekeepers didn't get singled out on that one. They got to spread the love around on the rest of the country. But it, it was a, a pretty bad year for beekeepers. 2010 for Sue Kobe quoted in the industry that full capacity with a growing demand. And the, again, that was due to the commercial industry trying to recoup its losses. And also with the media hype for saving the bees, there was a huge influx of hobby beekeepers moving into the hobby, wanting to uh, help save the bees and, and build up bees. So, the, the industry was really unable to keep up with the demand that was going on. And as a consequence, a lot of, a lot of queens, a lot of bees got sent out uh, probably sooner than what they should have. And the queen losses were pretty high. 2010, she's quoted uh, the queen loss rate now is about 35 to 37% and possibly growing. So the take, uh, take away from that, you're going to lose queens. There's nothing, nothing you can uh, do about it other than be aware of it, that you are going to be losing some queens. Next slide, please. Again, the question of why we're choosing it in the one word, sustainability. Um, Obviously, it's going to allow us to replace our queen losses. It's going to allow us to requeen our older queens. Uh, the average lifespan, productive lifespan on queens now is only running about 12 to 18 months. So we're, we're going to have queens that we have to replace. A good resource on that that I like to refer to is the beekeeping at Buckfast Abbey by Brother Adam. His uh, name was Carl Curl, uh, born in 1898 lived in 1996 and spent his entire adult life breeding and raising bees there at Buckfast Abbey. So he's a, a very good wealth of knowledge. He requeens about two thirds of his hives every year using overwintered queens that are uh, vetted out. You can check them for their laying ability. They've survived the winter. He doesn't requeen all of his hives. So that way, if there is a, a massive loss of overwintered queens, he still has uh, hives in order to uh, restart the And on the other side, if all of his overwintered hives happen to collapse, he's got new queens in order to, to get the apiary going again. So he has a, a pretty good system and he explains it quite well in his book. It also allows us to replace our hive losses. We're going to have some, even, even us experienced people. It's, it's nice to have the bragging rights that we didn't lose any hives, but um, we all lose them. I've lost more this year than I've lost in the last two years, which I've lost two so far and two nukes. And I knew the nukes were going to go. They were some late queens that I, I pushed the season on. The next point is completing the cycle of beekeeping. And this is kind of my favorite. Because as a beekeeper, you get your package and, and your bees and you dump them in a box and you try and get them built up through the summer. Or if it's your second year, you're hoping to get a honey flow off of them. And that, that's, uh, I think, about a third of the beekeeping experience. The is getting them through winter. We got to get them stacked, bad, taken care of, and try and get them through spring. And, and that's sort of the second part of beekeeping. So what everybody is missing is where'd your package of bees come from? Uh, what's it take to raise a queen? You learn the biology of queen rearing. Uh, the nutritional needs and all that. And it sort of brings the whole beekeeping experience full uh, circle. And that I find uh, is uh, pretty interesting. And so it helps. Uh, 
if you build in hive members um, an apiary plan, uh, it helps you build uh, your increase. The last point I was hesitant of putting up there, but then our last uh, club meeting at East, East Jefferson, the, the last conversation I got going was how bad, how hard it was for the beekeepers and queens once the major uh, package new queen push in the spring was, and those that needed to replace queens, they were almost unavailable. Find queens anywhere. The problem appeared to be nationwide. If you were a commercial guy and you ordered a box of 45, a box of queens, but otherwise trying to get onesie twosies, uh, it was very difficult for beekeepers to uh, replace me. So what I'd like uh, to share here, emphasize the uh, first year beekeeper, at least be aware of the issues and, and start formulating a plan that um, queen rearing should be a part of your uh, bee keeping experience. Uh, second year beekeeper, have a little bit of experience, by all means, jump in, get your feet wet, start raising some queens and nukes. Don't be afraid of losing a few. Um, that's how you learn. And, and as you uh, be able to get six more successful at it as you go, you'll have the replacements that you need for your for your hives. Third year beekeepers, just go for it. And then uh, get some advanced education, do some reading, studying, and learn some of the more advanced techniques of grafting, um, possibly in between like the Miller method. There's a lot of different queen ring methods, too much to cover in a, in a beginner's class. Next slide, please. So my second point that I'm going to cover is the uh, equipment needs. This is a couple of five frame nuke stacks sitting out in my front yard right now. If the picture was a little bigger, you'd see some bees there in the bottom corners. And uh, mine are bringing in pollen. The, the pussy willows over here are blooming, and, and it's, it's way too early, way too warm. But, um, that's a, a view of a couple of my nukes. Next slide, please. I'm going to go over the just kind of quick bullet point list here and then go into an explanation of uh, setting up the nuke after that. But basically, there, there's lots of configurations you can use five frame nukes, four frame nukes, the different hive configurations. Five frame nukes are easy to get a hold of. Almost all the mail order carries them. Most all the local uh, suppliers carry them. They're easy to get. So I would recommend that a, a new beekeeper look at uh, just using five frame nukes for starting their uh, queen rearing and overwintering. You're gonna need two deeps and or three mediums if you're raising your bees in mediums. Uh, pretty much same as your basic hive setup. Uh, bottom boards, I have that in plural, both screened and solid. I'm a favor of that setup. I fasten my screen boards right onto the bottom of the nuke, so if I'm transporting or moving bees around, I don't have to worry about the bottom falling off of it. And um, <clears throat> the screen gives them ventilation. And then the solid bottom board under that allows me to treat for mite without actually having the wand up underneath the brood, melting comb, risking um, burning a queen or whatever. So my OAVs are underneath the screen and it protects the bees on the, on the mite treatments. And then the solid board allows the slide to fit in. You need an inner cover, top cover. Again, I've got both on them, migratory versus telescoping. I favor the migratory cover in the summertime because it's easier to monitor the feed jars. And then I switch over to the telescoping in the winter. So that's something you can start with one, add the other one later and split the cost up a little bit. You're gonna need an extra medium super. As the, high, uh, as the little nukes build, it'll give them some extra room. For that time. And then in the winter time, you can use it as a feeder stem and for putting your dry sugar on top of the inner cover for feeding. And then the next slide, uh, I didn't get this piece of equipment in there, but there's a spacer ring, uh, vent rings that I use. You buy them over the counter, they usually come about an inch and a half. I build mine at two and a quarter put an inch wire on them and in the wintertime I can flip them over and use them as my quilt box so I'm getting double duty out of some of my equipment. Next slide please. So 
Well, here is the five point loop with the pole. On the right hand egg crate there is, is a deep and you can see the screen bottom board screwed to it. Uh, to the right of that is a second deep cover. On the other side is my medium. On top of that, I've got two migratory covers. How, um, I, I, the options that you can use for feeding. I've got a feed jar fit on one. And then on the other one is a one gallon can. There is some down points for the outside feeding. Uh, the heat tends to heat them up a little bit and they can leak a little bit. But generally the bees are hungry enough, they're cleaning them up fast enough that that's not a problem. I've got a couple of bottom boards on the ground there in front, uh, the solid for that. And then of course the uh, telescoping cover on the left. And that's kind of a, a breakdown of the hive parts. The cost, you're, you're looking at the same as a, as a hive stack. You're looking at 120 to $240 to get started. Uh, just with one nuke, and this is going to be per nuke. Now, again, you can sell just one box and then equipment as you need it, or you can get it all uh, right away and, and have it on hand so you've got it when you need it. Sounds like a lot, but when you consider queens at $40 a piece, and you're going to be replacing a queen now and then, packages running 150 and nukes up to 250 at the top, it's not going to take long to break even your investment of equipment by being able to replace your own queens and replace your own bees and becoming sustainable. Uh, I figure about, on average, about two years to, to break even on the equipment cost. Consider the loss of production. If you have a, a swarm, lose a hive right at the wrong time, then it's you, if you've got bees in your nuke, all you got to do is transform over, get, get your hive going again, keep it going, and, and uh, pretty much save your honey harvest. And then you start another queen in your nuke and, and get it built up. You've got the resource right there. So, next slide, please. This is just going to be an overview on some of the optional equipment that you do, just so you can be aware of uh, some of what's out there. You're not going to need all of this. Uh, these are some full frame mating nukes. Uh, you can push them together, and they fit on the footprint of a 10 frame box. You can you can uh, stack them up, keep them together. Next next slide, please. There we go. Here's some double mating nukes in, in my yard. Um, there's three of them that you can see, one just outside the picture. So each of those stacks, a different color, has a, a queen and colony of bees in it. And right, and just right there, there's eight colonies of queens and bees. Uh, part of it, I raise uh, 12 to 14 nukes every winter. So it doesn't take a whole lot of room in your apiary or yard to, to have a few nukes and queens. These are double resource hives. And uh, for those that want to, Study a little bit more. Some of the options. These are uh, promoted by uh, Michael Palmer. If you look up the National Honey Show on, on YouTube, and he's he's got several videos on there. But two: one on sustainable apiary, and one on queen rearing. About seven years old, but the information is still solid and good. Next slide, please. Another piece of queen rearing equipment you'll hear about is uh, queen castles. They come in different configurations, three chamber, four chamber. This one's a four chamber, the two frames in each one. Uh, the hole in the top there is just a ventilation hole. E each chamber has a vent and each one has a, its own entrance at the bottom. And this allows you to, to uh, get more queens mated with a smaller amount of equipment. And uh, yes, it is pink. My uh, that's my granddaughter's choice. There can't be raising virgin queens without having a pink mating nuke. So, uh, next slide, please. Here's some two frame mini mating nukes. Um, again, if you have extra queen cells, uh, you can get more queens raised with a smaller amount of resources. So with just two frames in there, you've got one frame of brood. 
uh, frame a foundation, a, fra a ship frame of bees, stick your queen cells in there and, and you can get more queens mated with a, a less resources. These are promoted by David Barnard Bees. He is in the South. He's got some good solid information, but just be aware that their weather and climate and season is much different than ours. So you have to, we have a much shorter queen rearing season, but this is a, a nice tool to use um, as you learn more about queen rearing and, and start raising more queens other than just uh, one or two at a time. Next slide, please. And if you sniff too much queen pheromone, this is where you're headed, it's down the rabbit hole. Um, this is just one of several stacks of hives I've got sitting around my house and shop. And over on the right-hand side of the, the nukes that are over there, there's enough equipment for about 16 queens in that stack. And then on the left, the stack of white boxes, those are um, your plastic shipping nuke boxes. Those can be used for getting started. And uh, you just you're going to have to put them into a wooden boxes where you can super them once they get mated and start building up. But it's definitely uh, feasible for getting started in those uh, portable nuke boxes. So if you have them, save them. If you know friends that have them, beg a couple from them. They're useful for a lot of things around the apiary. Next slide, please. So we're going to get to the uh, how to's uh, point number three. The, and again, it's sort of it's uh, going to be a brief overview. We'll get into more, offer more uh, depth of detail later on in the season. And this is just a handful of the queen ring books that are out there. Not even a quarter of them. I've read a lot. These are just the ones I own that made it into the picture. If you do like to read and and looking at, at some additional information. The two on the left-hand side, the Lawrence O'Connor books, uh, Wickwest Press, uh, Increase Essentials and Queen Rearing Essentials would be the two books that I would recommend for beginners to get to start raising queens. They, they cover quite a few of the methods and he, he offers um, uh, the information that you need. You need to uh, click one more on me there, Eli. And next slide, please. There we go. So we'll take a quick look at the bees. The bees are good at raising their own queens. Uh, we don't really raise the queens, the bees raise their queens. And here's the three main uh, methods. Uh, you've got your swarm cells, which is their basic reproduction. You've got supersedure, uh, the bees replacing a failing queen, uh, low pheromone, damaged, injured. And you've got the emergency response, which basically the queen's missing altogether. She's MIA. We're going to be focusing on the emergency response for this uh, method. All three can be used for starting queens. You're not going to get swarmy bees by using swarm cells, not in just a generation or two. It takes a bit more uh, continued breeding from them before you do start getting. But for, for just a couple of queen cells, any of these will work. Next slide, please. Uh, one of Eli's slides is showing some queen cells there on the bottom too. You've got your uh, swarm cells. Up in the middle, you've got supersedure cells. And emergency response um, cells generally uh, just wherever the eggs and brood are at along in that kind of a crescent shape is where you'll find them at, usually up in the middle like supersedure. Uh, next slide, please. So the requirements for raising good queens, basically lots of bees, lots and lots of bees, good strong hives. And the what you're gonna be looking for, if you have more than one hive, is you want a good solid brood pattern. Um, a couple, this is a slide of Eli's and it's showing a good, just a good solid brood patterns. And this is what you wanna look for in the parent hive that you're gonna be wanting to uh, raise bees from. There's, <clears throat> roughly about 24, 25 criteria. Every, uh, every book and every, all the be, uh, videos will give you a different, um, different list. Everybody's got their top 10 list. But uh, some of the primary qualities that you wanna look for 
is the fecundity of the queen, solid brood pattern, you know, how well is she laying? Uh, their industry and foraging, you know, they gotta have the forage bees be bringing in honey, nectar and pollen for raising queens. And then resistance to disease. So those, those are the main top three as uh, promoted by Brother Adam in the breeding of the honeybee. And uh, again, the, he lists maybe 12 more after that as secondary. So as, as you're not gonna have that to really um, pick from in your first year or second year, if you've only got one or two hives. So you just, you have to use what you have. The main thing is that solid brood pattern. And that was echoed by Dr. Tim Lawrence, who Kobe's husband, also a bee uh, scientist. And uh, he said the, the one most important criteria for raising queens for the hobbyists is that solid brood pattern. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Caught you off guard, Eli. Next slide, please. Nope. Okay, there you go. Um, there, yeah, okay. Maybe back up one more. Yeah, so here's the nuke, also known as a cell builder. Um, the, the main brood chamber there, you can see there's three frames there on the, the right-hand side of the picture and there's a divider board sticking up for um, separating them, that, that can be useful. Uh, not, not totally necessary, but uh, I just wanted to uh, give a quick overview of the nuke box again. So we'll go uh, ahead and uh, next slide, please. We'll be leaving it here for a little bit setting up the nuke. Um, you wanna get into your parent hive. And the first, th this is the difference between uh, re re raising the queens here in the nukes and a walk away split, walk away split. You basically, you go in there, you separate the brood, you separate the honey into two separate boxes, close the lids, walk away. One of the boxes is gonna have a queen. The other one has to make a queen. Then you've got two hives. But what we're doing, you're gonna have to go in and find the queen. And I like to put her in one of those portable uh, nuke boxes, close the lid and set her aside. Um, I just take the frame that she's on with the bees, drop her in there and set her aside. That way there's no risk of uh, moving your uh, queen or damaging her while you're going through your hive to pull some resources. Your first frame you want um, to be a, a, a honey nectar pollen frame, mostly nectar. Uh, for the bees to be able to uh, make their uh, royal jelly and bee bread to feed the brood. Your second frame that you're gonna put in there is gonna be your frame of eggs for the bees to be able to raise um, the queen cells on. You don't want a large frame of eggs. You can have a lot of cat brood, but you, you don't want a lot of mouths to feed. You want those nurse bees to focus on just a few of the larvae and the queen cells to raise healthier queens. So. Uh, I, I tend to favor frames that have a smaller amount of eggs and larvae on them. The number three there I put down is optional. If you've only got one hive, you don't want to strip too much resources out of it to get a nuke started. But if you do have a second hive, I would go in, find your queen, set her aside, and then pull an extra honey and pollen frame and add in with that um, hive. And then you're going to be shaking a couple of extra frames of nurse bees into that nuke as well to, to give them some extra bee power. And you could do that from your second hive if you have two hives or more. If you've only got one hive, I would only shake in maybe one frame of nurse bees off of the, of the brood into there. Then you can drop in your fourth and fifth frames of foundation, or you could slip in that, um, follower board in there if you wanted to take up some space and keep the bees kind of pushed over to one side so that they can conserve heat. But again, a couple of foundations in there's probably be enough. Slip on some pollen patty over the top of your brood, just a chunk, maybe two by four inches, two by six inches on top of the, or the egg frame. And uh, then you're gonna put on your inner cover and your lid, get your feeder jar on with one-to-one -one syrup and 
get an entrance reducer on there. You don't want a very big entrance. It's a pretty, pretty weak hive. You don't have much in the way of a forager bee, so you're going to have to make sure you feed this thing. The, the one thing for raising good queens is nutrition. She has to have, a, the bees have to have a lot of nectar and a lot of pollen to, to feed the royal jelly to those queen cells. Now, if you do have more than one hive and, and you're thinking of raising more than one, one or two queens at a time, you can put a second frame of eggs in there and get queen cells going on both frames. If, you're, if you've got an extra nuke box and you want to start a second one once the cells are formed. So that is another option of uh, utilizing your nuke box. Next slide, please. Timekeeping. This is where duct tape and a Sharpie comes in. You want to write it on top of the hive. You want to get the date in your log book. You want to put it in your calendar. Roll your sleeves up, write it on the bottom of your wrist with a Sharpie so it doesn't wash off in the shower. Um, the day that you uh, get those eggs into that uh, nuke box is your counting date for uh, the subsequent measures that you need to make on uh, when the, the cells are made. So you want to make sure you get that written down. Went one page too far in my notes. Next slide, please. This is just going to be a quick view on this one. There are other resources showing um, dates, emergent times, and all that. So this comes from Eli's um, material so that's available. Next slide. So what we have now is a, a box full of bees and with a frame of eggs in there, and hopefully those bees are gonna get started on raising us some queen cells. So by day three, from when you put that together, they should have cells started at that time. So you wanna open up your nuke, take out your two foundation frames, make sure you slide the third one out well out of the way. So when you lift out that frame with the eggs on it, and hopefully some queen cells, you don't bust or break them off, breaking them off on anything, any frames on either side of it and lift it out and see if you've got some queen cells. So generally you're gonna have, I would say three to five, three to seven queen cells in there, um, a few on each side of the frame. You wanna pick out your two largest ones, pinch out the rest. And the reason for that is that again, it reduces the number of mouths that they have to feed and the nurse bees are gonna concentrate the royal jelly on the two queen cells that they have left and feed them more, which is gonna give you uh, much healthier, much larger queens that, that just a, a better quality queen. Again, I mentioned if you have more than one egg frame in there, um, you'll be taking that out after a bit. So uh, one, once you pinch out the two, the cells, leave the two largest on, on your frame, close up your nuke again. And if you've only got that one frame in there, now it's just a waiting game. You've got two to three weeks to wait for the, the queen to hatch and uh, go out and get mated, come back and start laying. So no peeking. Uh, the virgin queens are really flighty. You can damage them, they'll fly away. The hardest part is not peeking. I peek all the time. <laughs> you just have to be careful. But if you do have more than one egg frame in there, then day 10 from when you put those in there, you're gonna to have to go in there and separate out that frame and get it into another nuke with uh, the, basically the resources that you have here, uh, a frame of, a uh, small frame of um, cap brood, some honey, a foundation, and, and then again, close that box up and leave it alone so that the queen can hatch. First queen out is gonna go around and kill the rest of the queens out. So if you're trying to raise multiple queens in there, you have to separate the, the cells and get them out of there. Next slide, please. Again, here's a, a queen wheel calendar that's available in the catalog. I'd like to have one. I, I haven't bought one yet. I'm using my calendar. And then it's, this chart, again, uh, available through Eli on our files. Uh, giving stats and, and the emergence response and growing queens. I won't get into that. Next slide.
Another picture uh, just showing a queen, life cycle of the queen. Lots of resources out there on queen rearing. Next slide, please. So a little bit of a queen chart here. Um, they're eggs for three days. The cells are formed from one day old larvae and actually uh, about 12 old, 12 hour old larvae is, is they, the younger, they actually prefer better. If you do get into grafting, it's hard to see those little guys, but uh, letting the, the bees pick out their own is, is they, they tend to pick out the younger larvae. They cap at day five from the cells being body or queen chart, say day eight, but they're counting back to the three days from the egg. And at this point, I don't really care about the eggs in there. We know that they're three days old. And I count my calendar from the day that the queen cells are started on day one there. They generally hatch day 11 to 13. It's somewhat temperature dependent. They can fluctuate a little bit. That's where if you have more than one frame of cells in there, or if you have a grafting frame, as a, later on, if you do that, you have to get them separated at about day 10. Takes the queens, the hatch queens, about three to seven days to mature, harden their wings, and get ready to fly and go out and mate. Uh, they require about 70 degree temperatures and no rain for their mating flights. And also the drones generally require the warmer temperatures too. So if we really have to watch the weather when we're queen rearing and hope for the best. That's uh, I generally start my queen rearing um, around May, about Mother's Day, about the time you're putting your tomatoes out in the garden. If you're gardeners, that's the time to get started on your queen rearing. Some of us with a little more experience may stretch that a couple of weeks earlier and, and then run them maybe a couple of weeks later in the fall as well. Queens go out and they, they, they only mate once, but they may take more than one mating flight. Um, they, can, they can go out one to three times and get mated. They generally mate with 15 to 20 drones, but they are not successful the first time out and getting adequately mated. They will make a couple of extra mating flights. But once once they're satisfied with their mating flights, then that's it for the rest of their life. They're done mating and they won't uh, go out and mate again. When they get back to the hive after mating, it takes them uh, three to seven days before you start seeing eggs being laid. The queen has to waddle around and push all the sperm that she received up into the spermatheca. And um, she only stores about 10% of the sperm that she receives. She expels the rest and the, her attendant bees clean it up and get it out of the hive. But uh, queens only use about 10% of what they receive. And uh, they spend a few days while they're transferring and maturing further before they start laying eggs. Next slide, please. Again, here is a, well, let's see, I missed a couple of my notes, but it's going to take you about three to four weeks before you start seeing results. Uh, the queen calendars here are good for, for keeping that all straight if you just have a few. Again, you can mark the dates on your calendar, so you, you keep them and then count out the days from the uh, queen rearing calendar. It's a nice tool to have. It's on my Christmas wish list here coming up. The next slide, please. So a quick review. We looked at why raise queens in one word, sustainability. We looked at the equipment needed. Just think five frame nukes. How to, again, with it in a short term, just um, a walkway split is, is what you're gonna, uh, for the how to's. What are your goals in uh, beekeeping? Um, why did you start beekeeping? Write those down and then have an apiary plan on how you're gonna fulfill those goals. If your goal is 150 pounds, 200 pounds of honey, mine was 250 pounds of honey. Then I found out that the state average was 37 pounds per hive. And that told me how many hives I was gonna need to get my 250 pounds of honey. Well, not every hive is gonna produce for you and some are gonna produce a lot more than 37 pounds, but that's the average. And that's how I kind of set my goals on what I needed for bees. So have an apiary plan and it's not set in 
goal that you can adjust it, move it around. But uh, queen rearing, I think, needs to be a part of that plan because it, it helps you uh, be more sustainable, raising your own bees, raising your own queens. Keep a logbook, get it all written down. And uh, so we'll bump to the next slide here. I'm an obsessive compulsive note taker. All my hobbies look like this. The wife's tired of tripping over all my three ring binders in the house for, for all my hobbies. And beekeeping was just another. Uh, the leather one is my uh, daily journal that I keep all my uh, weather notes, uh, nectar flows, uh, what I'm doing on the hives as a whole. My mite treatments I put in there in red. And when I have to do them again, so they jump out at me. I even keep a little, uh, page uh, note uh, card in there and uh, this date a year ago so that as I'm going through and, and uh, logging in my notes I can go back and look at last year and kind of scan what I what's going on and and kind of keep me abreast of, of my hives for my field logs I use these um, five by seven note card three ring binder these little uh, spiral binders and make up a little um, spreadsheet sort of thing and I can put a you know, queen plus or minus eggs plus or minus brood in all stages how many frames just go across it entering in the, the check points for for the inspection then each time I go and inspect the hive then I can look and see where their hive is growing or declining the binder above just my resource hive that's got my bibliography and my books um, there's uh, section in there for mite treatments, pest diseases, the, the sheets from the disease treatments are in there. Anything that's a resource that's going to help help you uh, find information on keeping your bees, I, I stick in there and, and separate it out by category. Got one on plants and whatnot. So again, this is just, you want to you want to keep a log book, you want to keep notes. You don't have to get as crazy as I do, but write stuff down. Next slide, please. So it's queen rearing for everyone. Well, it should be, I think, but the reality is no. And again, uh, the Ingeldorf's Dorp study showed that only 9% of backyard beekeepers, and that's those of us who have 50 hives or less, practice one of the following, and that's splits, raising nukes, queens, increasing hive numbers, or selling bees. And that's just one of those. Anybody that's doing multiple of those is it, even in a, a lower, uh, minority even yet. Our queen loss rates, hive loss rates here in Washington uh, averages 37%. Newbie keepers is about 50%. We need to be raising some bees to be locally sustainable. Um, just to put a plug in for our um, West Sound beekeepers, uh, during last year's survey, we had the lowest hive loss rate of the state at 27% for the club. So we were uh, doing a pretty good job in getting people's uh, hives to survive. So if we can get this number from 9% up to 25, 30% or 37%, if that's where the hive loss rates are at, then we can be sustainable within our local region by replacing the hives that are being lost. And those of us that are raising bees and queens and nukes, we, you know, I've got 12, I'm gonna use maybe four of them. I've got four to share, sell, give away, whatever. So we can become more sustainable if, if we get more people um, raising the, the nukes and queens. Next slide, please. Classes, continuing education, no matter where you're at in your beekeeping. If you haven't started uh, beginner's classes, I recommend that you get going on them, get, get started and start taking classes. And uh, just whatever level you're at, grab the next level and keep on going. If the certification's not your thing and you don't want to work on the public service points, at least take the academic part and um, get the knowledge. I've got a, a saying, the more you know, the more you grow. So education is a big part of everything that I do within life as far as um, any hobby, endeavor. It's just uh, keep learning. The next slide, please. 
the end game. I wasn't planning on selling honey, but here I am, honey for sale. I've got a little uh, honor box. I set up a beehive. Surprising how many people are afraid to go up there and, and look in the box. I think it's got bees in it, so they don't want to come and buy honey. They they come up to the house and knock, and it's like, oh, you just walk past it. But um, my goal is 250 pounds of honey for my own use for winemaking, baking, cooking, teriyaki sauce, and I ended up with about 680 pounds this year. So I'm now in the honey selling business. Next slide, please. So we can stop the recording and look at question and answers. I want to say thank you, Eli, for allowing me this opportunity to share. And uh, thank you uh, for those of you that stuck with it and listened. We are going to have a, a possibility of some a little bit more advanced information a little bit later in the season when it gets close to queen rearing. I doubt if we'll do a full presentation like this, but at the end of the April or May meeting, we can have a few minutes to answer questions on those that do want to start queen rearing and might need some extra help. Eli and Ron have their hive site chats. That would be a good time for folks to get together, to go, go through a hive, see what a strong hive looks like, and possibly uh, put together a couple of mating nukes uh, with a group and uh, give it a try as a group. And, and see how you come through with it. So there, there will be some additional uh, resources available for those that do want to start into queen rearing. I'm always open for private lessons. If, if you want to come across the water over here to my side to quill scene, it's a BYOB, bring your own box. So I'll spend an hour out in the apiary with you. We'll go through a hive, we'll stuff it full of bees and I'll send you home with a nuke of bees and, and you'll be on your way in queen rearing. So. It's, it takes longer to actually talk about it than it does to actually put a nuke together. So there, there. So I'll stop there, Eli, and we'll go into question and answer. Okay, thank you so much, Michael. We really appreciate this. I mean, this is like the best, best form of talk, I think, where a beekeeper shares what they do, why they do it, and made it so simple that it makes a lot more sense than reading through the seven different ways to keep bees. So I will stop the recording.